Uh, the national president of the American Legion Auxiliary, Lisa Williamson, spoke at the Rollinsford Post, and three of us were able to attend. And she spoke about her initiatives. The number one initiative was addressing military and girls veteran suicide, and in particular, to destigmatize getting help. So after hearing that, uh, I contacted the suicide prevention team at Manchester VA Medical Center, and they asked if someone would present the SAFE program to our unit. And LaShanta responded immediately, actually. I don't know why I seem surprised, but she responded. <laughs> you don't always get that good response. She responded quickly and agreed to our meeting. So LaShanta petrosky Ackley, thank you very much for coming. She received her master's in social worker from Salem State University in 2006. She began working for the Department of Veterans Affairs in 2009, joining the suicide prevention team at the Bedford VA Medical Center. In 2014, she became the lead suicide prevention coordinator for the VA hospitals throughout New England. In 2015, LaShata transitioned to Lowell Vet Center, where she provided individual, couples, and group therapy to veterans. She's currently now a suicide prevention coordinator at the Manchester VA Medical Center, and at this time, I am pleased to introduce and welcome you to our defense. Please give very much. Thank you for having us here today to yeah. talk about it actually, but it's also the VA's number one mission, which is suicide prevention. So part of my role as a suicide prevention coordinator is we do go out and do a significant amount of training in the community to educate and answer any questions about suicide. So as we said, there's less stigma in mental health. Uh, and so part of the role today is really interactive. So I'm gonna ask you guys some questions and um, feel free to you know, just ask any questions that you have. If I, I may have sometimes, I'll say it's a little bit later in the presentation, um, but I want you guys to be able to have any of the questions that you have you know, answered tonight if I'm able to do so. So in our team in Manchester, there's myself and another social worker whose name is Melissa, and we'll talk through a little bit about our role and you know, what suicide prevention efforts throughout the VA. So in saying that, suicide prevention, can you guys see? Yeah. Okay. Um, is a really difficult topic for some people, right? There's many people who have been uh, personally impacted by suicide, and so at any point in time, if you need to take a break, um, please feel free to do so. And it, also, if you need to touch base afterwards, I'm, I'm free to be able to stick around for a little bit and, and have a conversation. I've also put some swaggy kind of items out in the back. Um, actually, I forgot to put out our business cards that I will leave there for you as well. So if something comes up a little bit later, you have the phone number and email address for our team. Okay. Uh, throughout the presentation, we will talk about 988, which is the uh, National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And by pressing one, you get to burn to the Veterans Crisis Line. And I'll talk in more detail about what that is and what happens if you are to call it. All right. Mm -hmm. So we will go over objectives and facts about veteran suicide, uh, some common myths versus the realities of what we know about suicide and suicide prevention mm -hmm. efforts. What in the VA we call safe, um, which is, you know, for all of you who served in the military or actually married to a former military member, we love our acronyms, and so we'll go through what SAFE stands for, um, as well as additional resources that the VA has to offer. So, oops, sorry, part of that is we will go through kind of the general scope of what does it mean and what are some of the facts about suicide among the general population as well as the veteran population throughout the United States and how to identify someone who may be at risk at first suicide. So what are some of the biggest questions you have at this point about suicide or crises or, or working with people who may be out of crisis or, or thinking about suicide. So anything that comes up for people at this point? Well, like, how would you start the conversation? Like, are you doing okay? Like, are you thinking about suicide? I mean, you don't like to come out and say it, but you, kind of, what's the best way to, to do that? Yep, so I'm gonna, this is one that's going to sound silly. We are gonna address that exact issue because it's not an easy thing to ask someone, right? are you thinking about suicide? It's a really anxiety provoking thing. So I've been a social worker 
for pretty much my adult life. Um, and I worked the majority of that time in mental health and particularly suicide prevention, right? And I will say, even to this day, it is something that when you're in a moment where you're thinking that someone may be at risk for suicide, it can be a really anxiety provoking thing to have that conversation. And we'll talk through how to do that. Any other questions? So we're going to start with some facts about veteran suicide. So suicide is considered a national public health issue. It is the 13th leading cause of death in the United States. 13. Right? Um, so when I first started in suicide prevention many months ago, they used to say that for every suicide, five people were impacted. Right? When I first started in suicide prevention, we actually were not researching a lot. They didn't have a lot of information about suicide prevention. That was only 15 years ago, right? And so there's been a lot of efforts on behalf of the VA, um, as well as private organizations to learn more and understand about suicide, suicide prevention, the impacts of that. So as they kind of looked and talked to people about the impact of suicide, they found that 135 people are impacted by at least one person who attempts suicide or dies by suicide. Right, so we're talking friends, we're talking family, we're talking community, school hey. systems, the veteran community, particularly now in a time where social media is so prevalent in our lives. Right? I have many, many veteran friends and family members who sometimes may have lost contact with someone for 15, 20 years and finds out about suicide death through social media. Someone that normally, maybe a few generations ago, we would not have known that they had passed away. <laughs> And part of this is suicide can be a really complex issue. I like to say when sometimes when people die by other means, heart attack, cancer, those type of things, there really isn't a question of what happened. We know how they died, right? It's a simple answer of what happened. When we talk about suicide, um, it's often very complex. It's a group of risk factors and protective factors and things that come together that there really is often not a clear answer. And we can't usually point to one thing. It's a combination of many different things. And the other piece too, is there's no easy equation. I think this is the next slide. Yep. So this is here, a list of risk factors and protective factors. So sometimes one of the questions I get asked is, you know, what does it mean? Like if I have so many risk factors and so many protective factors, Am I protected? Am I at risk? How exactly? What's the mathematical equation here that decides where I stand? But the reality is that no one can answer that question, right? Some person may have one risk factor and a whole bunch of protective factors and die by suicide. Or somebody else may have a whole slew of risk factors and never even think about killing themselves, right? And that is one of the things that becomes really, really complicated for people in understanding what happens when someone dies by suicide or is even thinking about suicide. When we look at these lists here, if you think about this kind of list right here, so prior suicide attempts, this is a risk list, mental health issues, uh, substance abuse issues, access to lethal means, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, recent losses in my life, legal or financial challenges, relationship issues, unemployment, and homelessness. We think about these risk factors. These are things that, to your point, is these are things that some probably not doing okay, right? If you have somebody in your life who has some of these things going on in their life, we are often asking them, how are you doing, right? Can I help in some way? Can, do you want to talk about it? Right? These are those things that we often reach out to people and we're worried about them all then. May not be worried about suicide, but we are just worried about them in general. Right? On the other side, protective factors. So access to mental health care, sense of connectedness, right? being part of a, a community, um, problem solving skills. I know how to work through some of the things I'm going through. I feel like I have some hope around that. Uh, a sense of spirituality, a sense of mission and purpose in the world. Um, these are physical health, employment, as well as social and emotional well-being. So if we look at that list, we often think those people are not really thinking about too much as far as what's going on with them. They seem like they come and have their life together with that. 
right? And so these are often kind of when I think about risk factors and protective factors, there are things that we're commonly thinking someone's life is going pretty well or there's some struggles, right? And what we think about when it comes to suicide prevention is when we're seeing things, some things on the struggle list is are we thinking about suicide as a potential subject that we need to talk about? And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. One of the big things that we find in suicide prevention is access to lethal means being a risk factor, right? And so in the United States, what I'm talking about for the most part is firearms, right? And we'll go into some data about that. So if you look at this, this is from 2023. 20, um, if we look at the veteran population and then we have the non-veteran U.S. population, you can see pretty significantly, particularly around the veteran population, firearms. Firearms is the number one way in the United States through general population and even more so in the veteran population that people die by suicide. Right? So this is the number one way. It's not that other means don't happen. Um, but they are more likely to die by suicide, by fire, than in any other means in the United States. It's not necessarily true across the world, right? Other places have other means, but here in the United States as well. And so part of this is really thinking about what I said earlier about complexity of suicide prevention, right? Is that there really is nothing like going to the doctors, having blood work done and x-ray done. There's no test I can run to say whether someone's at risk for suicide. So when somebody has some of these risk factors going on and you're really worried about them, one of the number one things that we can do is talk about lethal means storage, particularly if someone is a firearm owner, right? And this doesn't necessarily mean removing the firearm from the home. And what I will often say, is it's really about involving that veteran or that people in that conversation. And in my opinion, before they're ever in crisis, having that person's rights as a firearm owner being honored and respected is really important. And the reality is there are times in people's lives that it's not really safe for them to have firearms in their home, right? Or on them or having access to them. So some of the things that we talk about is having a plan that if you're in a bad way, what do you want to do about your guns? Is there somebody that you trust to hold on to them? Is there a component of the firearm that you would be okay with somebody taking? Um, do we have gun locks on them? Do we have, if we have a safe, can someone change the combination to the safe? And I know, you know, I grew up in a hunting family. Um, if I ever took the guns with my father during deer hunting season, it would be a big problem, <laughs> um, right? And it would never happen. So how do you work with the firearm owner around these things? And so some of those ways can be, are you going hunting with a buddy? Have the buddy hold on to the fire. Go hunting for the day, have a great time, and then return the gun back to the front. Have the front take it home. So you have it, you're still engaged in the protective factors of being involved in the community, having a sense of mission and purpose, right? How do we talk and work with the firearm owner? This doesn't have to be a battle about gun rights or who has it, taking things away. This really is what is everyone most comfortable with. But I think this is one of the things that sometimes people don't think about in regards to suicide prevention. And we'll talk a little bit about why planning for this ahead of time is also really important. This is why. Right, so there was research done on people who had a serious suicide attempt survive, and this is basically based on an interviews of people who end up going for medical care, right? It's an emergency room, mostly. And what was asked of them was, um, what was the time frame between the time that you thought about taking your own life and attempting? Like, What's the, how long did that take you from going from one to the next? 24% of people said less than five minutes. And in graduating time, so less than 20 minutes is 48%. 71% of people said less than an hour. Now this does not mean that the suicidal thoughts came out of the blue. 
Oftentimes, people who are struggling with some of the problems in their life have been struggling for a while. But something happened. It may be something small that happened. It may not be a really big thing, but it's the thing that all of a sudden it hurt, right? That we went from a person who was struggling to a person who says, I can't do this anymore, right? And so when we can build in lethal means restrictions, what we can do is save a life. Because what we find is once we pass that first time frame and people are struggling to access lethal means, they sometimes reach out for help. They reach out for support. They run into somebody, right? So if we can get past this kind of first wave of times when people are acutely suicidal, that period is often fairly brief, right? And so this is where putting time and distance between a suicidal person and lethal means is the most important. If we look at the second graph, what that is talking about is firearms particularly, right? So the, the pyramid to the left is the red right there, it says 85 to 90% fatal. That's firearm injuries, right? So if someone attempts suicide by firearm, they are 85 to 90% likely to die. The other piece, the 5% is any other means. Overdosing, hanging, jumping from a tall structure, any other means, they are more likely to live. And I'll t we'll talk a little bit about why that is really important. So as from my intro, I'm from Massachusetts, <laughs> right? Not a very gun friendly state. Um, what we find in stats is uh, Massachusetts is one of the lowest gun ownership rate, uh, rates in the country. Uh, it's about four, uh, fourth of the national average. Um, in Massachusetts, we have just as many people who attempt suicide as any other state, right? So I work for New Hampshire. New Hampshire is the exact opposite. They're on the higher end of the spectrum for suicide, right? We have about the same amount of people who attempt. New Hampshire has one of the highest suicide rates in the country. They've always been in the top 10, right? They happen to have higher gun ownership rates. And we find this to be true, right? In states like Maine, New Hampshire, the higher the gun ownership rates, it's the higher the death rate by suicide. It's not the attempt rate, it's the death rate. And that's because the more people who tend to own firearms, who they are not stored away from that person during that time, are more likely to die by suicide than by any other means. Does that make sense? I'm not From here is why legally and safety works. Good. People who are suicidal and have a suicide attempt and survive are about 90% of those people do not go on to die by suicide. That is often a very shocking statistic for people, right? Any thoughts about why that might be? See the bottom that hurt, don't want to do it again. Yep, they might be hurt and do not want to do it again. Absolutely. You got somebody's attention. You got somebody's attention? Yep. Change your mind, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of things on that, and I'll talk about that in a second. What we often find is somebody who attempts suicide, they end up in the hospital, right? They're, they need medical intervention. Families can be shocked, friends can be shocked, especially if they didn't know this was coming. Now this becomes a window that they are forced into talking about whatever brought them to this point. That may be in mental health care, right? There may be medical care. There's things that the family, friends, community become more aware of, and those people come around and support that youth. Oftentimes, they do engage in some type of mental health care where they sometimes gain some of those protective factors like problem solving skills, things about homelessness, employment, those services can be wrapped around them and take some of those risk factors away, right? And the more of those skills that they gain, the more community, the more education they gain around mental health and mental well-being and addressing their problems that brought them to that point, that now they have those skills for the rest of their lives, right? So they're less likely to die by suicide. They're also more likely to see the signs earlier on and get help before it comes to that integral point where they're thinking about taking their own life, right? Um, you said something now, I'm forgetting what you said, sorry. <laughs> Changing their minds. Yep. Giving it some thought. Yeah, so oftentimes, 
One of the things that we love about firearms is the accuracy of them, the speed of them, the ease of them, right? What we find often in people who attempt suicide by other means, other than firearms, they are often calling 911 on themselves. Not all the time, or they're calling support, they're calling for help, that they change their mind. There is a wonderful documentary called The Bridge. Uh, the Bridge is about, I don't even know how they did this because it was post 9-11. Um, they were able to put cameras on the, on the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, and they did a whole documentary because previously the Golden, Gate Grit, the Golden Gate Bridge was the number one place in the country to kill yourself. You boy jump off the bridge. Um, they've since put up netting to help save and rescue people. Uh, but prior to the netting, there's a person who's pretty actually famous for jumping off the bridge. And he reports the second my fingers left that bridge. I regretted my decision. And we often find that to be true. He was able to flip himself around, that he went feet first into the water instead of head first. And somebody saw him the second he left the bridge and happened to have a friend in the Coast Guard who happened to call their friend in the Coast Guard. That person answered and got a boat to where they belonged, where he, where he jumped. And um, he went down to the water and um, I think it was dolphins swam around his feet and helped bring him up to the surface. And the Coast Guard got there and rescued him. He broke like 80% of the <coughs> bones in his body. And now since then, he actually dedicates his life to suicide prevention efforts in getting help, people help him support. But we often find that to be true. So when people have other attempts, sometimes there's that window that they say, I don't want to die. And they can reach out for help. Really difficult to do with a firearm. Some of the common myths that we see in suicide prevention that people will talk about is that people who talk about suicide are just seeking attention. The reality is no matter how casually or joking someone talks or threatens suicide, we need to be taking that seriously, mm -hmm. right? We need to be asking them, are you thinking about suicide, right? Are you thinking about killing yourself? And if they say they are just joking and, and they are just joking, we, it's also a point of um, time to talk with them about the problems of suicide prevention in our country, right? That this isn't a subject that we can joke about. We really need to be taking people seriously when they're having these conversations. Um, the only one who can really help someone who is, a, who, is a, who is suicidal is a mental health counselor or a therapist. What do people think about that one? Your friends and other health cloud work, right? Yeah, so um, special training is not required to safely raise the subject of suicide. Helping someone feels included in showing genuine, heartfelt support can also make a big difference during the challenging time. Mm -hmm. So some people who are suicidal do end up in mental health counseling because the problems that they're dealing with, they don't know how to deal with it on their own, right? Mm -hmm. And their friends and their family may not also know how to deal with that on their own, right? And so mental health counseling makes sense. But the reality is oftentimes we have a lot of stigma around mental health in general and seeking help. Um, and people don't often talk about this. It's also uh, costly to seek medical help and the therapists and all that. Yep. Experience, so there might be a concern financially for that person so that they can't do it. Yep. And that is where, fortunately, I will say, um, in the VA, veterans tend to be fairly lucky on this, right? There's a lot of mental health care through the VA, uh, through the Vet Center system, which I previously worked for, um, and which is free counseling for veterans, um, as well as the VA. Uh, so there's a lot of supports out there. There's also groups through things like American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. They tend to have a lot of groups around. So there are supports but it can be very expensive. And it can also be difficult sometimes to find a mental health counselor, particularly one that you may you know, have a good relationship on in the poor about. Um, but absolutely, right? So I think sometimes it really is that community that can help support someone. Sometimes it is mental health counseling and really working with that individual around what are those needs and supports that that person particularly needs. In regards to the veteran population particularly, only about a third of veterans who are eligible for VA healthcare engage in VA healthcare, right? And so 
when we're talking about suicide and suicide prevention, there's a lot of veterans out there that we don't know who they are. We're really relying on the veteran and community population to help identify these veterans and, you know, be able to get them over to care if that's what they need, right? And that could be mental health care for that also could be things with employment and housing and, and substance use or anything else as well. So this is the steps for VA safety. So when we talk about this acronym, what SAGE stands for, <laughs> S is signs of suicidal thinking. Um, A is the most important question of all. V is validating the veteran's experience. E is encouraging treatment and expedite getting help. So we think about suicidal thinking. Some of the things that we're looking for is when people are talking about feelings of hopelessness, feeling that there's no way out of their situation that they're currently in, an increase in anxiety, agitation, changes in their sleep pattern. So for some people, this is gonna be sleeping too much. Other people, it's not sleeping, right? It could really go either way. Right. Um, or changes in their mood, right? And so these are people just saying you know them in the community and they're just not acting like the way that they want the way to. So changes in their mood swings. Uh, feeling that there's no reason to live, right? This is that speaking to that mission and purpose piece, right? That there's nothing about my life that is worth being here for anymore. Increase in rage or anger. Uh, engaging in a risky activity without thinking, uh, particularly when it includes alcohol or drugs, and withdrawal from friends, family, or other social events that they're normally involved in. Right? This is a person who's kind of pulling back from their life, right, and saying my life isn't worth it. Good. Nice. These things are signs about immediate risk, meaning someone who's doing these things are probably thinking about and potentially planning for suicide right so thinking about hurting or killing themselves they're actually making direct statements about suicide um looking for ways to die um talking about death dying or suicide or again uh engaging in self-destructive or risk-taking behavior especially when it involves alcohol drugs or fire or any other type of weapon Knowing how to ask the most important question of all. Anyone know what that question is? Are you thinking uh, about committing suicide? The heck's Yeah. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about committing suicide? Anyone know why it's important to be that direct? There's no ambiguous about it. It's, okay. it's, it's direct, it's right there. It's, yeah. It's what it is. Yeah, I think sometimes I've heard from people, are you doing okay? You are right. Are you uh, thinking about hurting yourself is another really common one that I hear. Um, the reason why we want to be this direct is we really want to get to the heart of are they thinking about ending their own life, right? So are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about suicide? Um, it's that specific because sometimes people do hurt themselves, right? They self-harm, right? There's um, people will cut themselves or burn themselves as a way of releasing mental health stress, but their intention is not to kill themselves, right? Um, are you doing okay? People aren't doing okay for a lot of reasons. They may not be thinking about killing themselves. So by asking this direct question, what we're doing is letting two things letting people know that we're open to having that conversation um and letting them know that we're there to be able to support them and that we want to know that specific answer sometimes what i hear in talking to people who are suicidal is they don't want to burden their loved ones by telling them that they're suicidal right so this kind of tells people that I'm willing to hear this, right? If you're thinking about this, I want to know about it. What I often tell people too is, I don't care what you think about burdening your family. Your family is really worried about you. And they have a thousand thoughts going through their heads right now about what's going on with you. By telling them what's going on with you, you're actually probably shrinking down the scope of all the things that they're thinking about that might be going on, right? And by actually telling people what's going on with you, now we can start to make a plan to support you. 
if we're filled with what ifs, what if this, maybe this, maybe it's that, maybe it's this, we can't really do anything as a family member. We're kind of stuck because we don't know what the problem is. So once we can identify the problem, we can then rally support from the friends, community, other people, um, potentially professionals around helping with that, whatever that particular issue is, right? So some of the things that we say are do's and don'ts about uh, talking with somebody about suicide. Um, so we want to be asking a question if we're seeing some of these warning signs. We're not just kind of asking the question out of the blue. It's because we have particular things that are going on with that individual that we're concerned about them. Um, do ask the question that flows naturally with the conversation. So the way I use this as an example is, you know, sometimes when I'm talking to a, a veteran or somebody else, it may be, hey, there's, there seems to be a lot going on with you right now. Sometimes when people um, have these things going on with them, they've thought about killing themselves. Is that something that you've thought of? Right? As a therapist, I say, I've heard people, right, who've told me things like this before, and sometimes those people have been suicidal. Is that something that you're thinking about? Right? So it's something that really normalizes what's going on for them, and it tells them that you're there to be able to talk about that, right? Um, and that sometimes people who are struggling with those things have had thoughts about suicide. We don't want to ask the question as if we're looking for a no answer. You're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? Right? You say it like that, what we're telling that person is I'm actually not open to having that conversation, and you were going to get a no answer. We also don't want to ask the question as if we're halfway out the door, right? Because if we're walking out the door or they're walking out the door, people aren't usually turning around to have this pretty difficult conversation, right? And so we want to be doing it while we're able to kind of be in the space with one another. Uh, what's your thoughts about asking somebody? My concern would be, am I planting a seed mm -hmm. in their mind that they really weren't thinking about it, but now I've asked that question and they're like, hmm. Yep. I'm, that would be my concern. Yep. That, for the longest time, was one of the myths that we had close to this. I don't know why they took it out, because that is often one of the things that we do hear from people. The reality is asking someone about suicide is not going to put the thoughts in their head. All it does is open the door that if they're having the thoughts, you're giving them the space to be able to talk about it. Any other thoughts? Sure. So what I want to do is take a few minutes um, and just kind of practice with the person next to you, right? Even in little small groups about asking in turn. Well, actually, you know what? We have a little exercise later where it's a similar thing. So we'll wait for that. Validating the veteran's experience. So we're talking openly about suicide. We're asking them questions about suicide and suicide prevention. We're allowing them to talk. Right? Oftentimes, this is time frames where people are holding a whole lot in and they're not talking to people. And so by opening that door and saying, hey, I'm worried about you, tell me what's going on with you. Let them talk, right? Because this is weight that they've been holding on themselves and they don't know what to do with it, right? So if they decide to take that courageous moment and even tell you that they're struggling, let them kind of go through and tell you what's going on. What we really want to do is validate what they're saying, right? And so I think one of the natural instincts that we all do is kind of cut people off sometimes and say, oh, don't worry, it's going to be okay, right? I've been through that before. It's all fine. We're good. You're good. Fine, right? And we cut people off from really expressing themselves. Let them talk. Right? Because think about if, you're, if you've ever been in a moment that you're holding something in, and it's a struggle for you, the second that someone allows you just to speak freely, it feels like we're lifting weight off of us. It feels really good sometimes to have a good cry or really just to talk with someone about something that's going on and really be able to kind of divulge that information. Uh, and so that itself can be such a stress reliever. We want to validate whatever they're saying. So if they say something is really important, really scary to them, really stressful for them, we want to say, yes, it is. 
right? Be, just because it's not stressful for us doesn't mean it's not stressful for them. One of the examples I tend to use for this is um, I'm a dog owner. Um, I have a yellow lab whose name is Tucker. He's almost five. Um, and uh, he is my best little buddy. We walk every day. I love the snuggle of my dog. Uh, my children will tell you he's my favorite child, and I don't expect <laughs> that. Um, yeah. If anything happened to my dog, I'd be devastated, right? I, he's, he's my walking buddy every single morning. You know, we watch TV together. He's awesome. Um, for someone who's not a dog owner, they wouldn't understand that, right? He's just a dog. It's a pet. Who cares? Blah, blah, blah. But for me, I'd be devastated. I will be taking time out of work when my dog passes away, right? And so I use that as an example because just because you don't see it as a serious problem doesn't mean the other person doesn't. So if they're telling you this is a problem, it's a problem, right? And so that's what we mean by like validate is that rent experience. We want to reassure them that help is available, whether that's through friendships, whether that's through community, through the VA or some other resource, that whatever their problem is that they are facing, there's support available for them. And maybe you're a person who can help get them there. We'll also talk about other resources that can be out too, because I think that's another fear sometimes with people, um, when they, we talk about asking the question, right, is if they say yes, what do I do then? Right? And we have supports available for that kind of 24 seven for the community as well as the veteran population. Zone five. How many we have next said fully clear on. So um, encouraging treatment and expedite getting help. So part of this is if someone says that they're suicidal, we don't want to kind of walk away from them. We don't want to lean to the right. Right? This is the great thing sometimes about having cell phones now today so we don't have to walk to another room to use the phone. Um, you have to talk with them, sit down, talk with them, take that time with them, right? One of the things that we can do if someone has hurt themselves or is about to hurt themselves, we absolutely want to be using the 911 system, right? We want to be able to get that person off to, to the hospital where they can be evaluated by a professional and hopefully get additional care, right? And medical care also if needed. Besides that, we can use the Veterans Crisis Line, right? So we are not expecting everyone in the world to become a mental health clinician and know what to do, know what the resources are uh, in the community for different people, for different things. Oftentimes we don't know this unless we are a person who happens to work in this field who knows what all these community-based resources are. And so that is where 988 comes into play. I'm gonna skip the side and then we'll okay, go back to this. <laughs> so, Veterans Crisis Line. Do we have the ability to call by dialing 988? Um, you will get a brief recording that says, if you are a veteran or a loved one of a veteran, please press one. By pressing one, you're diverted to the Veterans Crisis Line. If you stay on the, not, on the 988, you are talking to the National Suicide Hotline which is great for any civilians or anyone else that you may know. It's the same phone number, right? They didn't want to reinvent the wheel. By dialing one, you go to the Veterans Crisis Line and they'll talk through that process. They also have an online chat feature and a text message feature. I encourage people to put these numbers in their cell phone uh, because the text message number is not always intuitive to people. Um, and Oftentimes I'm asked this later and I never remember the text message number, but I do remember 988, right? It used to be 1-800-273-TALK. That number still works, um, but they made a national initiative across the country to switch it to 988 last July, right? And so if you dial the 1-800 number, it still does work. It will connect to, um, they'll have that around for the next several of years just in case. Uh, but 98 was just easier to remember, right? And so that's where that just came in. So this line is for veterans, family members who are worried about a veteran, as well as service members. So anyone can call. So the crisis line was originally created in 2007. Uh, the Veterans Crisis Line was originally known as the Veterans Suicide Prevention Line. 
And um, I actually started the VA a few years after this was created. And what they heard and what I heard sometimes from veterans is I was homeless, I was broke, I had my significant other broke up with me, my dog died, substance abuse, but I wasn't thinking about killing myself, so I didn't call the number, right? Uh, so they reinvented it and they decided to change it to the veterans crisis line in order to really capture anyone, maybe in some of those risk factor stages before they're even thinking about suicide to be able to call again support. Um, they launched the online chat in 2009, um, the text message component in 2011. Around 2011, they came out with a documentary from my HBO called The Veterans Crisis Line. Um, if you watch it, it's a great documentary, but HBO was up there for two years. Um, they took some of the most sensationalized calls because they're HBO and put them in a documentary. It looks like the Veterans Crisis Line is calling the police all the time. They're not. It's less than 2% of the calls that ends up calling in a rescue. And what I mean by that is someone is at immediate risk to harm themselves or someone else. They're not willing to kind of work around safety and putting away kind of whatever means that they have. And so the crisis line then can kind of initiate the 911 system. So that's what I mean by a rescue. But it's less than 2% of the calls that end up in that. Um, so after the documentary came out, uh, there's more awareness around the veterans crisis line. The amount of calls just started flooding the system and they expanded uh, the, the call centers and they have a lot more staff now between 2016 and uh, 2018. Uh, if someone were to call the crisis line today, what happens is every single month for a year following that initial call, they got what we call a caring contact. So it's a postcard that gets mailed to them at their house. It has some type of wellness stuff on it, just checking in on you. If you need anything, feel free to give us a call. It's, it's a kind of uh, simple, kind of caring contact. Um, and the reason for that is through research, we found that just simply, like you were talking about these visits that you go to, knowing that somebody cares and sent something to you, visits you, calls you, that is actually a suicide prevention initiative, right? That it breaks down loneliness and isolation. And so it's a wonderful way of just, hi, how are you, right? Those simple things. Uh, so that's where the care and contacts line came into place. Um, and then of course in 2022, it was relaunched into the 90B. So these are some of the numbers that you'll see. So they take an enormous amount of phone calls, right? It's available 24 seven. So if you're in a room with someone they say that they're suicidal, and you're like, I have no idea what to do now. Call 988, talk with them. They know what to ask. They know what those details are. They'll be able to help you and that individual make a plan for what those next steps are. Maybe it is going into mental health care. Maybe it is going to the ER. Maybe there's another solution out there, right? That you haven't thought of, they haven't thought of, and they'll be able to talk you through it. For the veterans crisis line, the question is usually, what happens after I call them? Right? So if a rescue is sent out, your local suicide prevention team will be notified of the fact that you, that um, a first responder was sent to your home. So the police, whether you go to the ER or not, they will be, we will be notified and we will follow up. If you are calling, there's no rescue. It is now an option for you. We have people who call in the middle of the night because they can't sleep. They have a nightmare. They don't want to wake up their spouse. And so they call 988, right? And they talk through it. At the end of a call, you're going to be asked, do you want a consult to your local suicide prevention team or your local VA? If you say no, I have no idea that you called. Any providers you have have no idea that you called. It can be completely anonymous. If you say yes, my team, so myself and Melissa, will get what we call a consult. We get a little paragraph about what that phone call was about. We get your name, we get your phone number, and we're giving you a call back on the next business day. So, right, we're responding to those calls Monday through Friday. If you're really in crisis, if you're really struggling but don't need to go in the emergency room or have a response, 
they will work with a veteran to say, hey, how about we have someone call you back on Saturday and Sunday and check in with you until the local hospital is able to kind of get in touch with you. And we call people back. They may not be suicidal. That may not be the reason why they called the crisis line, but they may be looking for therapy. They may be struggling with a whole bunch of different things. And we're calling them back. We're just kind of triaging that. Hey, what's going on? Uh, let me see what resources we have available for you and get you hooked up in the community or through the VA, all right? And so we are trying for at least three consecutive days to get a hold of someone to be able to offer that support. Yeah. So you say you don't need help, nothing's going to be done. You do need help and your local agencies are aware of it. Are they going to initiate red flag on you or? No, nope, so red flag, um, and every state it's doing it a little bit differently, right. and I know right now, I mean, that's the yellow flag law. Um, a lot of that has to do with, um, are you safe to have firearms, right? Um, and so if you are actively suicidal and you're threatening to kill yourself with a firearm and you're not willing to maybe safety plan, right, to give it to your body, right. um, there may be police intervention to take away firearms from you. That's going to be situation by situation that the, the town, the police officer, the veteran themselves are going to make that decision. And then based off of laws and procedures, it will figure out um, how and when you can kind of get those firearms back. It's really different state by state. And in all honesty, it's sometimes it's not really that clear as well. Um, but the reality is calling the crisis line um, isn't going to be an automatic, you call the crisis line, you now no longer have access to your firearms. Um, it really is about people. Are you willing to work with people? Are you willing to kind of put some time and distance between yourself and lethal needs? Um, most places are willing to kind of work with that. The reality is too, if you call the crisis line and the police don't get called, if you're not part of that 2%, I'm not calling you police. Yeah, just a lot of people I know probably, uh, mm -hmm. like, you know, it'd be like your father. Yep. You take my gun, I have no reason. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sets even yeah. more things than a lot of people that um, shy away from the mental health part. Yep. Because that's a, a serious, you call VA for anything. Uh huh. Are you thinking about suicide? That's the first question. So yeah. I asked on a phone call to set up your appointment for getting your meds or whatever. Yeah. Um, they don't want to initiate anything because everybody knows about this yellow flag or red flag and they mm -hmm. go, what? Nope, I'm not going to say a word. Yeah. So oftentimes the yellow flag or the red flag laws are about people who are, we're really worried about, right? Who's not willing to work with anyone around safe storage, around engaging in treatment, right? So there are people who will not do anything different with their firearm storage, but are willing to go to therapy. They may go to a treatment program. They may address whatever those concerns are. I can't say always, cause I can't say always about anything. Um, those are usually not the cases that a you know red flag or yellow flag would be put in place and it's actually statistically it's very rare that actually that lie at this point in time comes and put into action i'm not quite sure what the numbers are locally here uh but it's not a law that is used on a very frequent basis it's usually kind of a last case scenario uh where that is in place i do hear that though from a lot of veterans and a lot of firearm owners since i don't want to um Go into mental health care because my state is a yellow flag or red flag or I, or just in general on the right of the, losing my firearms. Um, I will say this is something that VA providers, right? Majority of veterans, the reason why we talk about 73% of veterans um, who die by suicide die by firearms is because veterans are more likely to be firearm owners than their civilian counterparts, right? And so this is a conversation that we are having often we any mental health trainer uh trained person in the va we've all had lethal means counseling we talk through like how to do that how to talk with someone about their firearms this is part of just our regular annual training that we do as a mental health provider in the va i will say in the community right it really is up to the individual person and agency that they work for about is this a part of their education and you can ask them right um I know as firearm owners, this is a concern. And so I think about a therapeutic relationship really is about how long, 
how well you and I get along together. If you don't like me, you don't feel comfortable in talking to me, therapy's not going to be as successful, right? Because you don't feel like you can tell me about what's going on with you. So part of that, that's a real concern. It's worth in the beginning when you start talking to a mental health provider is asking them, have you had any training around talking about lethal means safety as part of your education, right? What is your feelings around this? If per somebody tells you, uh, I don't think anyone should have a gun, right? Not the therapist for you, probably. <laughs> uh, and if someone says, you know, when somebody is really struggling, I talk with them openly and honestly about maybe different ways that we can talk about firearms and firearm storage. And, and we're going to have a conversation about this if that becomes a thing for you. Um, how does that feel, right? That's going to feel a little bit differently right versus somebody who says i'm gonna take them away and you're never gonna see them again right and so i i almost think about engaging in therapy as being almost a two-way interview right is you decide whether you like me as a therapist and i decide whether you're a person that i feel like i can help right and and it's important to be able to ask those questions and we call it lethal means counseling there's a lot of um organizations out there one of them is walk the talk america uh walk the talk america works with mental health providers and they actually have a list that therapists can put their own name on it um, that says yeah this is something that i really agree with right is mental health counseling and firearms education really kind of coming together and so that is sometimes a place that you might be able to find like a local list um all really depends on whether people know about it um about whether they put their name on that list uh, there's another training that's called CALM and stands for um, Counseling Access to Lethal Means. And it's a training that actually started in New Hampshire uh, that has gone nationally, um, that people can take a training on how do I counsel people around lethal means in regards to suicide or homicide risk, right? And it's really for mental and health providers. I check we have you come back. Yep. Um, William James College outside of uh, Boston as well does an entire free training for clinicians on this exact process. They actually have the ability to bring firearms on William James campus for this particular reason. So clinicians can hold firearms, learn how to fit on a cable lock, learn how to fit on a trigger lock, those type of things and really like understand a little bit more about the firearms community. So there's a lot of different opportunities out now. And I think this is really where a lot of efforts in suicide prevention is going, is really bringing these two communities together. When I first started in suicide prevention, we knew, right, guns were the number one way that people killed themselves, but yet no one in suicide prevention was talking to the gun. We just didn't have this conversation. There was such a fear over the political upheaval around talking about taking firearms away from people that no one dared to cross that barrier. Um, and there's a woman whose name is Kathy Barber, who I've worked with a lot out of, the Harvard, uh, out of Harvard, who really is nationally recognized um, for her work in suicide prevention. She's worked with the state of New Hampshire. Um, for anyone who's a firearms instructor, there's a great videos out of Utah um, that came out. She was actually the person behind creating a lot of things with Utah and Montana. And we actually just shot a video in Massachusetts that was released a month ago um, that I actually started as the clinician and Kathy was behind that video and really talking about this exact subject, right? And so this is something really that um, particularly the VA, but in general, so you have community is really talking a lot more with the firearms community yeah. about this, right? Because we want to get out of the political realm and really into the responsible firearm ownership route, right? Because that's really what we're talking about here. Any questions about any of this? Can anybody ask great questions up? So we're going to talk through uh, a few other resources that we have. And then we'll go back and practice a little bit about, you know, having these conversations. So this is the website for the Veterans Crisis Line. The great thing about this is if you go onto the main website, so veteranscrisisline.net, there's a lot of different features. This is where you'll find the online chat. That there's also a tab, it's a little blurry, I think it's that one, uh, that says local resources and supports. If you pull it down, you get to that box. You can put in your zip code, and then it will literally give you the list of your local VAs, 
your local VAT centers, and I'll talk about the VAT centers in a second. Uh, area hospitals, community-based providers, actually gives the email group to our team, as well as the team in Tobis. Every VA across the country has a suicide prevention team. So you'll get all those direct phone numbers, email groups, addresses, how far away they are from you. How be able to do as it. a post body check to really yeah. see steps? Yeah, so. Where does the public we get in? I don't that know. That's a great question. I, I think a lot of it is more VA-based resources in local hospitals and that kind of thing versus um, local, more community-based. So this is more like ERs and um, those kind of things. Uh, has anyone ever heard of the Vet Center? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Safe. Yep. Um, so the Vet Center system is part of the VA, but separate from the medical hospital. So what I mean by that is they have a separate medical record system. Sanford is the closest one to here, is that correct? Um, there's 300 vet centers nationwide. You have like seven or eight, I think, in the state of Maine. Um, and what they are is they are a group of clinicians, mostly social workers and psychologists. Um, and they specifically deal with a certain subset of the veteran population. Uh, they have their own medical record system that is no one can access. So when I worked for the Lowell Vet Center, the Sanford Vet Center, and you say you went to therapy there, I have no idea what your medical record is, I can't access it. It's literally separate from facility to facility. Um, they do individual couples and group counseling. The veterans that they work with are combat veterans, veterans who have experienced military sexual trauma. They work with Gold Star family members around Greece. They work with grief around anyone who's lost a veteran to suicide. So they will do bereavement counseling regarding suicide and death. Um, they work with anyone who is activated for a man-made or natural disaster. So anyone who is activated for COVID, uh, going to Katrina, uh, any of these kind of things, they'll work with them. Anyone who is actively serving in the National Guard, um, or on active duty, they will work with around issues of transition. Um, and they'll also work with people who are currently in school who are veterans, talking about that transition going from military life to a school life because it was a really difficult transition for them. Uh, and then they also work with anyone who um, had any involvement with drug interdiction. So mostly that's our hosties. Um, so a lot of this is, you know, they, they focus on areas of readjustment is what they do. They do readjustment comes like those services are a hundred percent free. So I know VA, we have our service connection. We have our means testing. We have all these different little avenues. Basically it's based on your DD-214. If you did one of those things, you have free counseling. Um, they do all different types of activities and groups. This really can, can be like a sense of community on top of that. And they work collaboratively with the VA, but actually a vet center clinician cannot talk to the VA without a release from the veteran. Um, they were stood up by the Vietnam generation uh, who really struggled with the VA and their return home from the war. Um, so they started what was called rap groups. And they were groups where people came together and just talked about their experience in Vietnam. Um, and they started happening all over the country. California and New York will both claim the first vet center it's still a debate about where that came from. Uh, but eventually they lobbied Congress and get, got federal funding for it. Um, there's 300 currently. There's in a process of, I believe, they're adding three more this year um, into the system. Um, they're really a loved community of uh, the veteran population. So they have, I think it's 97% satisfaction rating for the veteran population. And you don't see those numbers often. Um, and so they are right here locally and you know historically they've always been known as the best kept secret at the VA uh, and I think in the last five or six years they you know the vet center system has been a little bit more well known. Uh, this is uh, don't wait reach out so this is just another avenue to be able to see so uh, quick resources and easily like how do we get to resources for for veterans um, make the connection is another website that the VA put out. And so this is really geared towards people who say, I'm the only one. Um, they have drop down categories that you can kind of click on. And basically you will end up finding a veteran who has a, probably a similar story um, that is telling their experience. 
Um, and so it really gets to that piece of someone saying, I'm unique, I'm the only one, no one knows how to work with me, no one else knows how to deal with my problems. And they find out that there's other people like them. Uh, this is about gun locks and safe storage. I have some of the flyers up there and look back. That exact flyer is of that. Um, we also have a huge group of population who works with the LGBTQ plus population. We have particular groups. We have particular trainings. This is uh, an area in a population that we work very, very closely with because uh, they have dealt with a lot of trauma and stigma in their time and service. Particularly, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who um, were dishonorably discharged due to don't ask, don't tell. Right, all of these things are something that the VA is looking for. This, I have some of that as well. This be missing from it. These are all free VA apps for your phone. If you type in VA and really almost any of these, you'll be able to get them on your phone. They are not connected to your medical record. They don't ask for your social or anything like that. So the reality is even as a non-veteran, you can use them. Uh, but they have a lot of things around helping people with sleep issues, with relationship issues, um, with mindfulness coaching, all these different things, substance abuse, all these different things of uh, tools that we can have kind of right on our, our smartphone devices uh, to be able to help with additional support. So I have a fly to help back to that. This is the newest app, which is a safety planning app that really helps people walk through, what do I do in the time that I am feeling at uh, struggling or a crisis? Uh, we also have this, this may be a piece for your group. Um, the SMR consult at VA.gov is how you get to them. This is a suicide risk mitigation <coughs> consultation program. Um, anyone can use this, right? So it really is for um, someone who's struggling with suicide and people who are like, I don't know what to do to help this person. We can use it as VA employees, Hus local hospitals can use it that they really help talk through a scenario. They're kind of experts in suicide prevention through our research branch, but they'll help kind of talk through, what do you need to do, right? Am I doing everything that I can possibly do? Yes. And, yes, uh, and this is uh, work that we put together for, unfortunately, when we lose someone by suicide, kind of some post veteran work. So we <coughs> work with friends and family around the death of a vet, right? This training that we're doing today is on psych armor as well. Um, so psych armor is an educational um, platform that the VA has partnered with to basically have this training virtually. It's not live, it's recorded training. But at any point in time, any of the stuff that I'm saying now, if you're like, what was that thing again? This is where you can find it for free. And of course, we're always happy to be able to come back out. Um, but that's always available for maybe some members of your group um, that um, you know, aren't here tonight. And then the VA is on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and Twitter. So thank you all very much for having me out. I'm going to leave our business cards out back. Uh, we have the email group and the, and the voicemail and the phone number and things like that. So if you do have any additional questions kind of after this, um, feel free to give us a call. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to give you a certificate oh, of appreciation you. and so a sincere appreciation of your service to veterans as a suicide prevention coordinator at the Manchester VA Medical Center and for supporting families of veterans with the, the SAVE training presentation. Uh, we'd like to give this uh, from the patrol to the statue. Thank, Thank you so much. I know everybody's enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.